This episode is brought to you by Audible. For a 30-day trial and one free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash multiamory. So before we get started today, Dedeker has a super exciting announcement for all of y'all out there. Oh, am I announcing it myself? Yeah, tell okay, us. Okay, I Dara. guess I'll do that. Um, oh my goodness, I'm so excited. I finally have an audiobook version of my book. Yay! And waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. It was so frustrating because it was out of my hands, was in the publisher's hands, but... They, they finally, just did it. Yeah, they did it. They got a producer to do it. Um, and it's coming out today, the day that this episode comes out. It's out on Audible. So if you go on Audible, you do a search either for my name, Dedeker Winston, or if you search for The Smart Girl's Guide to Polyamory, you can finally get the audiobook version of my book. Woohoo! We say this a lot on this show, like, sometimes it is okay to aim for neutral. You know, if the mm -hmm. best you can get on any day is, like, acceptance, like, okay, I can accept that I feel like a slob right now. I can accept that I feel like a failure right now, but, like, I still accept myself. Like, I think that's really important, even if you're having a hard time feeling like you can actually love yourself in a particular moment. If you're happy with the same old ways of dating, if you enjoy sucking at communication, and you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships, broaden your sexual horizons, develop a better understanding of yourself, or learn more about non-monogamy, then you've come to the right place. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multiamory Podcast. On this episode of the Multi-Amory Podcast, we're talking about self-esteem. You mean that participation trophy bullshit? Oh, heck no. <laughs> heck no. So what are we talking about then? We're talking about self-esteem in how it actually can be helpful in your life and mm -hmm. isn't just rewarding you for showing up. <laughs> right, which is very different from, I think, the self-esteem that we were fed as millennial kids of the 90s. <laughs> I wonder if that's changing now. I think like... People realize that just telling your kid constantly, like, you're the best thing that's ever happened on this planet is maybe not the best thing ever. Well, I know there, there has setting been setting himself up for expectations that are not going to be met. Yeah, well, there has been some change in the way that the school systems, at least, are employing self-esteem education. Oh, because, really? because research has shown, like, just trying to boost self-esteem period just giving people rewards for showing up and anything is actually not effective has mm. not been linked to better achievement has not been linked to better grades like none of that um yeah. so it has started changing where it's now like oh whoops we maybe missed that one a little bit God. yeah um and i was actually reading an interesting article about it talking about that it it isn't that self-esteem itself is not important but it's that some research was done on it and the school system was like, and parenting, you know, sort of pop parenting advice mm -hmm. was like, we're just going to run with this before the research had time to catch up with like, actually, how oh, are the best oh, ways to teach self-esteem? Oh, yeah. interesting. How do you teach healthy self-esteem? It's not so simple as just saying. Just kind of artificially inflating. Giving trophies for everything and, and yeah. not making any difference between the feedback you get for when you do something well versus when you don't. So anyway, just that it kind of got ahead of actual research about how to do it. Interesting. Yeah. 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 So why are we talking about this today? Well, I think it's interesting because I just got back from my uh, best friend's baby shower, a friend that was very close to me uh, all through high school and college. And um, we've still remained close to this day, like about 15 year friendship. Um, but she is having a baby, so I went to her baby shower, and she just... Oh, I, should ho I hope she's not throwing a baby shower when she's not having a baby. No, no, no. <laughs> she is having a baby, and therefore a baby shower. <laughs> um, but also, like, she just finished her residency and got her, like, dream job um, as a doctor, and is married, has a home, like, all of these kind of milestone things that people look at 
and they're like, oh, okay, this means that this person is uber successful. Like you can measure their success in a variety of ways. And it's difficult, I think, to not compare yourself to that and be like, well, I don't own a home. I'm not having a baby. I'm not married. You know, things like that. And the normal maybe, hallmarks of exactly. what we've been told is success. Yeah, which we've obviously talked about a lot um, on this show and the relationship escalator and stuff like that. But I think that um, there is that that idea that if you're not successful, then therefore you're not worthy or you're you might have lower self-esteem. There's definitely been times where I'm like, wow, like I'm an unsuccessful person or I'm worthless in a way uh, Mm -hmm. just because because I'm not where some of my other friends are in their lives. Have there been moments like that in both of your lives? Oh my goodness, like the whole comparison train fueled yeah. by social media especially um, is yeah. Yeah. it's just really a bear. I mean, I've definitely had an interesting times recently, particularly since publishing my book actually, mm. where I have a couple of other friends who are authors and it's like this weird mix of if they have a particular success, like I don't know, like I'm so I'm blanking on like getting what's to it, certain like charts on getting Amazon to certain or something charts or, or getting yeah. an interview in a particular yeah. medium or even honestly getting their audiobook produced <laughs> before um, yours, yeah. earlier than mine yeah. um, like where it would be a mix of feeling really happy for them I guess maybe even compersive for them one sure. might say like feeling really happy for them because I can relate to like wanting that kind of success and but then also feeling kind of jealous and envious being like oh like I wish I had that I wish I could get that and then the third part of it being a self-worth thing mm-hmm. of like uh I'm a terrible author like I'm not worthy of this I haven't gotten this because I must be bad or no one cares about the stuff that I do or yada 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 um and I, I mean, for me, I've recently try, tried to take out that self-worth bit and like acknowledge, like I can feel the jealousy, I can feel the compersion, like that's totally fine to feel those two things together. But if I can try to not let it dictate a story about me, yeah, that'll probably be better for me. Um, but that's my ongoing journey and challenge right now. What about you, Jays? Yeah, I think for me, so we'll, we'll get into this a little bit more in a bit, but one of the troubles with having lower self-esteem is having a hard time handling criticism mm. um, of just it, of it kind of hitting you a lot harder and having kind of meaning about your self-worth kind of like you were talking about that it's that it's not just a criticism of a specific thing it's more like oh this is about me as a person and I know that that's something and, and it varies from time to time and later on we're going to talk about some of the tools and ways you can keep yourself on like the higher side of self-esteem. Um, but for me, there's definitely times where getting some sort of criticism either about mm. like my work doing visual effects or about this podcast or about something I've written is like really crushing. Yeah. Mm. Um, versus other times where it's like, mm, dang, I don't still don't love it, but it's not quite so personal. Yeah, like it doesn't yeah. quite send me so much into the like, what, you know, what am I doing? I should just quit. Like this is... It doesn't quite define you as much. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I definitely noticed those extremes show up in my life. Got yeah. It. Yeah. So um, can we talk about some terms? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to start us off with the, the, the one? Yeah. So what we're talking about right now is self-esteem. So this is defined as the positive or negative evaluation of the self So it can be specific, like I'm a good communicator and I am proud of that, or it can be general, I'm a bad person and nobody likes me. It's usually described as a trait, which is relatively consistent throughout life, but it is possible to change. So like, I think I'm a nice person and people tend to like me, (laughs) uh, kind of thing. Yeah, well, it's, it's, this was interesting, like within psychological research, calling something a trait Mm. that in itself is like, kind of like the debate with the attachment styles. Like, is it a trait or is it something else? Because if it's a trait, it, that kind of means it's more like inherent in you and you are just one thing and that's what you are your whole life. So self-esteem is generally referred to as a trait where it tends to get set kind of earlier in life, like attachment styles and you tend to be kind of consistently there. Yeah. However, you know, it is possible to change it and to, uh, sort of 
affect the way that you fluctuate up and down around that range. Um, so it's not something you're totally stuck with. But I thought that term was interesting, like that I didn't realize trait was so specific yeah, in psychological it. literature. Yeah. yeah. So that's in contrast to self-worth. Sometimes those te- terms are used interchangeably, but self-worth is sometimes used to describe the more general aspect of self-esteem. So as in about like your value as a person, mm-hmm. like what just what your value is on this earth in this life, rather than tied to specific skills, like, oh, I'm good at communication or I'm good at this or I'm bad at that or whatever. Interesting, yeah. Uh, no, for sure. And then we also wanted to, to make a comparison and a contrast to confidence. Or self-confidence. Or self-confidence, mm-hmm. yeah. So it's, it's obviously related to self-esteem, but it's not quite the same, um, right? So confidence is about your belief in your ability to do something, it's a little bit different than just sort of what you think of yourself as a person or what you think of your skill level. Uh, and confidence is interesting because it's, it's something like a lot of these things that you actually want to have a balance of. Mm-hmm. Like there's a lot of people who are like, I just wish I was confident all the time. And it, the way it was explained to me once was sure. But if you were ultimately confident all the time about everything, you'd be like, Oh, absolutely. I could go, ride a bull with no training mm-hmm. because I'm so confident that I can do anything and then you die. Right? Oh, Let me just attest as a woman who for a long time thought she was attracted to men who are confident all the time. Mm. Mm. Uh, not a good just at first. arrogance. It's attractive at first, yeah. but it's really not great if you're confident all the time. Right. You so need some variation in there. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of about finding that balance. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. that makes sense. Um, So when we were looking into self-esteem for this episode, um, there was um, a study that was sort of a review of various other studies done in 2004 that showed um, that a broad broad review of the correlates of self-esteem, that means like when self-esteem is high, these other things have also been found to be high. Mm. Um, They found that high self-esteem is associated with better physical health, better social lives, Um, better protection against mental disorders and social problems, um, more successful coping mechanisms, and just general mental well-being. So that's a lot of stuff tied to this trait. Absolutely. And that's why it's something worth talking about. Yeah, Yeah. could we actually, we were going to talk about this list of of kind of the opposite side of people with low self-esteem, what traits they Mm -hmm. tend or what characteristics they tend to exhibit. But since you just gave that list of kind of the positive (laughs) things, let's kind of keep going on with with the more positive things. Yeah, so, okay, people with higher self-esteem tend to have these six attributes. So the first one is a greater sense of self-worth, which we said before, it's like that broader general thing like Mm -hmm. i am you know a good person or i'm worthy or something along those lines um also like you said jace greater enjoyment in life and in activities um and then also freedom from self-doubt that's a big one yeah yeah yeah, not constantly questioning whether or not you can do something that Mm. is another one though where i feel like it's like the opposite side of the coin from confidence where Mm. i think you need some self-doubt in your sure. life, like well, a little some bit humility, of I guess. Yeah, humility yeah. and self doubt. Like, I think that is healthy. But like, if you're doubting yourself all the time, yeah, and you're just like paralyzed from it, then that's not good no. either. Um, so, uh, people with higher self esteem also tended to have freedom from fear and anxiety, freedom from social anxiety, and less stress in general. Um, more energy and motivation to act. And as well as having, I think this is kind of related to the social anxiety thing, um, having a more enjoyable time interacting with other people at social gatherings. Mm. Um, And when you're feeling relaxed and confident, other people feel more at ease around you. This one is interesting because I, like I'm such an introvert and Mm -hmm. tend to feel like really stressed or anxious in social settings, especially like loud crowded social settings. Um, But when it's like smaller intimate gatherings of all people, People that like I love or I've known for a long time, then, then like super great. I love it. It's yeah. super great, and I think it's that same thing of like I have a lot, I guess, lower self esteem and more self doubt when I'm in, around strangers than I am around people where it's kind of like okay, I know these people love me and accept me, yeah, and it's mm. okay, and so I feel more able to relax and feel confident around these people. Yeah. So I guess that makes sense. Um, in contrast, the study also found that someone who has low self-esteem may show some of these characteristics. They may heavily self-criticize and they may feel extremely sensitive 
to outside criticism. So they may really easily fall into comparing themselves to others in an unfavorable fashion, or Mm. they may feel uh, extreme envy more frequently than maybe someone who doesn't have very low self-esteem. They may feel chronic indecision or an exaggerated fear of mistakes or of displeasing someone else, kind of like the self-doubt thing, or maybe even being afraid to assert themselves or afraid to have boundaries in the first place because they're afraid that it's going to be a mistake or it's going to make someone mad at them or things like that. Um, They may experience a lot of guilt. They may dwell on or exaggerate the magnitude of past mistakes. Mm -hmm. I think that past mistakes really get to people in the self-worth department. You know, like a lot of people... Even if it's something like, I'm not even going to talk about like super devastating past mistakes, but maybe something like a really tough breakup or a job decision or something like that, that people can really fixate on like, that was such a huge mistake and like, I'm such a terrible person or mm-hmm. such a, you know, stupid person um, mm-hmm. for, for doing that or, you know, any kind of like negative language that you're applying to yourself. Um, people with low self-esteem may feel Uh, This says invidiousness, which I don't even know (laughs) what that word is. Can you Google that really quick? Yeah, let me Google that. It sounds very literary, and I like it. While you're doing that, I'll keep going. Um, uh, May experience jealousy that's extremely difficult to shake. You know, like maybe once you've talked everything out with your partner and you've tried going to therapy, you've tried this, you've tried that, but like you're still unable to shake a particular form Mm. of jealousy. It could be a sign of some low self-esteem or just some general resentment toward other people. Yeah. Um, And they also tend to see temporary setbacks as permanent and intolerable conditions. I think that also from what I've seen, sometimes um, if you have low self-esteem or you're going through a period of low self-esteem, it can be really easy to fall into a place of like, I deserve this bad thing that happened to me. I deserve this setback and it's not going to get any better because this is just as good as it gets for me. So I think that story creeps in a lot too. What'd you find out about invidiousness? So invidious means tending to cause discontent, animosity, or envy. Oh, Uh, to Um, to invid? Can also mean envious is a a synonym or is is one of the definitions is envious. Mm, Um, So they basically said envy, envy, (laughs) jealousy. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can also be, specifically, it's envious of a kind to cause harm or resentment. Okay. Right. So right. kind of a, the real like negative side of, of envy and jealousy yeah. in comparison. And briefly, before we move on, I just want to put out the disclaimer there that like all of us as human beings experience both sides Absolutely. of this and go through periods of both sides of this. It's, there's very few people out there who just have bad self-esteem all the time or quote unquote good self-esteem all the time. Like it's very normal to go back and forth between these. Um, so it's not like there's these quote unquote people who are doing it right and people who are doing it wrong. Yeah. yeah. Right. Or like your parents just ruined you when you were a kid <laughs> and now you're stuck with low self-esteem and there's nothing right. you can do about it. Right. Like yeah. that's, that's not the case. Right. <laughs> no, for sure. Yeah. And thankfully there are whole fields of research into exactly this into like, how can we change this? How can we give ourselves better tools for dealing with these things and for increasing our self-esteem and our confidence to healthy levels, right? (laughs) To healthy levels. Um, I did want to really quick um, just mention that it's interesting reading about this, that one of the things um, a lot of the articles and the studies brought up was people tend to associate high self-esteem, like overly high self-esteem with narcissism. Mm. And it's, it's, it is that I'm going to get to that. You want to get to that later? Okay, cool. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that in a sec. (laughs) But first, I guess we should take a quick break to talk about some ways that you can support our show. Yeah. So the first of all is if you want access to an amazing community where you can discuss some of these things that we talk about in these episodes, as well as being able to share your personal experiences in a place that is private and full of people who care and want to share and want to support you in your own journey, in your own relationships, whatever those look like. Um, The best way to do that is to become part of our Patreon community, which you can do at patreon.com slash multiamory. And there you'll get access uh, at the $5 level. You get access to our private invite only Facebook group, as well as our private discourse forum and our discord for you gamers out there. At our $7 level, you also get ad-free episodes um, a day early, so you don't have to listen to this part of the show. You get bonus content also. And you get bonus content in most episodes. Mm -hmm. Most, if not all, of the episodes have some bonus content. 
Um, and then at the $9 level, we have a monthly video discussion group that we do with patrons at the $9 level. Um, and at the $15 level, we send you a thank you video and you become our best friend. There's lots of wonderful things and all sorts of different levels for whatever you want. So do that at patreon.com slash multiamory. And if you have not done this already, then please go to either iTunes or Stitcher and write us a review. Um, it really helps us show up higher in search results when people are searching for things like polyamory or relationship podcasts or something along those lines. Um, the positive reviews make us show up higher in those search results. So it only takes like a couple minutes it would really, really help us out. Um, tell us the things that you love about the show. Uh, then we get to read them later on and feel really good about ourselves, which we appreciate. <laughs> uh, but also just it, it will help more people like you to find our podcast. So again, go to iTunes or Stitcher and write us a review. Mm -hmm. So our sponsor for this week's episode is Audible. But yeah. this is a very special Audible ad because, the oh specialist. my goodness, the specialist Audible ad because my audiobook for my book is finally being released today, actually. So on this exciting. very day that the episode's released, my audiobook is also being released. It's so exciting. It's been a long time in, in the making. And I've had so many people reach out to me being like, where's the audiobook version? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? And I can finally tell those people, it's here. <laughs> here it, it exists. Is. It is here. So here's a double whammy. If you go to audibletrial.com slash multiamory, here's what you're going to get. You're going to get a 30-day free trial to Audible that's going to include a free audiobook. If you want to use it on my book, that's great. You Obviously, can get my book for free. Do it. That's what I would recommend. Um, <laughs> listen to it. It'll be great. Um, and uh, you'll get you know, this free trial of Audible. You get the free audiobook that you get to keep, even if you don't continue the trial. And they'll also give us a little bit of a kickback. Again, even if you just do the trial. So... Basically, you're getting the audiobook for free. Exactly. Right, right there. That's exactly. What else Probably do you the need? easiest way for you to get my audiobook for free. Yes. So, again, go to audibletrial.com slash multiamory, sign up for the trial, use your credit for my audiobook. It's a double whammy of making us all feel good. Yay. And me especially feel good because I'm so, so excited to be sharing this audiobook with people finally. So, that's it. All right. Back to it. So something fun that I found in doing some research about specifically polyamory and self-esteem is that in one particular study from 2003, this was part of a doctoral dissertation that I was reading, super entertaining, fast reading, uh, and in that they found that of the respondents, over 70% reported that engaging in polyamory had increased their self-esteem and their love for their, their partner that they were with before getting into this. I think okay. this was about people who had opened up a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, well, upwards of 90% uh, contended that polyamory had contributed to their gaining a better perspective on themselves and on their partners. That's interesting. really interesting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and it's, it's interesting. It's only this one study. It wasn't a huge study. Mm. So this is definitely an area that I think would be interesting to see more research. And I hope that we end up getting some more research yeah. specifically yeah. on this. Um, but 70% is it was actually 74%, um, if I remember right That's from reading it. 74% said that engaging in polyamory increased their self-esteem. Yeah. I think that's, that's pretty incredible. remarkable. Yeah. yeah. Why, why do you think it would do that? Are there some good reasons as to why polyamory would increase someone's self-esteem? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think there's maybe you can look at like more surface level reasons of mm -hmm. like just more people think I'm sexy or yeah, like, sure. you know, I'm right. going on dates with multiple people and it feels great. Yeah. Um, so like, I think there's that, I think on a deeper level, at least where I tend to come from, I think, and also, especially I've noticed this in working with clients that like when someone's really struggling with something, whether they're like struggling with jealousy or struggling with kind of accepting or struggling to find a partner or something that like, once they kind of get to the other side of their struggle, that's a huge self-esteem boost mm. and definitely a huge self-efficacy boost of knowing yeah. like, oh, mm. I can do this. I can do something uncomfortable. I can do something that's, you know, coloring outside the lines that goes sure. against the grain. That's maybe a little weird or a little scary, but I can do it. And that really, I find, leaves a lasting effect on people, even on people who end up closing up their relationship. Yeah later on like that mm, they still feel like wow like i did that i went out on a limb i tried it i put you know i went outside my comfort zone 
and like that feels really good so i I don't know that's again my armchair psychology hypothesis about that and i feel like yeah just it when jace when you and i were opening up our relationship and when it was really great with uh with dedeker and things were just awesome and like i felt like everything was kind of flourishing i feel like it also really added to our home life at the time Mm. and that it made it better in a lot of ways. And like it bred kind of a, a more intimate thing than we had ever had before and just more communication and stuff. We had talked about that. I remember at the time. So I think that, that being able to see your partner be attractive to someone else and, and then getting to talk about it and, Mm. and I guess getting to experience that sort of intimacy from a different standpoint can bring two people closer. That's interesting. Yeah. And maybe yeah. make you more, have self, more self-efficacy or something. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like it's also maybe a little bit, you're sort of forced, <laughs> like essentially by doing polyamory, if you're coming from a more traditional monogamous mindset, you're basically saying I'm going to willingly have the worst possible thing in my life happen, which is my Uh, partner sleeping with other people. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you find out that you lived through it, Mm -hmm. that even like, again, like Dedeker said, even if you eventually end up deciding not to continue having polyamorous relationships, you're like that happened and I didn't die. My life wasn't over and I wasn't rejected by everyone and didn't, you know, it's kind of like by experiencing like, Oh, that thing I kept thinking, oh gosh, if this happens, my life is over, yeah. happened and my life wasn't over. Yeah. Mm. So I think there could be some value to that mm. too. That's very cool. So I want to at least give some airtime to um, talking about the fact that self-esteem and having good self-esteem or high self-esteem, uh, it's hard a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. It's really hard. And especially like I think the self-love movement I ironically both love and hate in equal measure, (laughs) like love it because I do think self-love is like so important and so great, but then also hate it because like the pressure that we put on ourselves to feel self-love can really backfire, Mm. I think, and leave us really not loving ourselves so much. Um, So there's this psychologist, Albert Ellis, who is actually really critical of the self-esteem movement. It's not just him. There's there's a number of other people who are critical of it, Um, but he specifically, he argues that, relying too heavily on just raising self-esteem, it can create this, what he calls a boom or bust effect, as in like only feeling the boom when you're receiving compliments or positive feedback and then feeling the bust or feeling a down um, when that's absent or when you're receiving criticism or things like that. Mm -hmm. And so he specifically argues that instead of going for high self-esteem, going for self-acceptance, Um, specifically unconditional self-acceptance. And I actually really like that. And I don't think that self-acceptance and self-esteem are necessarily... um, Mutually exclusive. Yeah, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Um, Specifically, you know, this idea of unconditional self-acceptance, it means accepting yourself unconditionally, acknowledging that there's going to be both virtues and faults in yourself. And yet, even in spite of that, continuing to be okay with it. Mm -hmm. And so actually the official definition that he gives of unconditional self-acceptance had a lot more of the word love in it. It was a lot more of like, you know, in spite of everything, you can still love yourself or, you know, you can love both your faults and your virtues. And again, I wanted to take out that, even though I like the Mm. sentiment, just to kind of remove that pressure. Cause like feeling self love is hard. Yeah. And we say this a lot on this show, like sometimes it is okay to aim for neutral. You know, if the mm-hmm. best you can get on any day is like acceptance, like, okay, I can accept that I feel like a slob right now. I can accept that I feel like a failure right now, but like, I still accept myself. Like, I think that's really important. Even if you're having a hard time feeling like you can actually love yourself in a particular moment. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. I, I feel like it's related to kind of what, I was teasing earlier about confidence too, about finding a balance that it's not just about more is always better. Mm -hmm. And I was actually having a a conversation with a counselor recently about anxiety, about like worry essentially. And something that she said to me that I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense is she's like, the goal isn't to get rid of anxiety. 
It's not to get rid of worry. It's to find a balance, yeah. right? Because if you didn't have any of that, you're going to be oblivious to dangers or potential pitfalls around you. You're going to be blind to those, kind of like having too much confidence, right? You're going to walk off a cliff thinking like, oh, I'll be fine. I'm confident that I can land on the ground, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and not hurt myself. Uh, that it's just about finding that balance. And for me, at least, that was really valuable to make the shift from the fact that I have these feelings is just bad to being like, no, this is okay. I just need to find a way to balance this better. Mm -hmm. For me, that, that was really valuable. And I think it's a little bit similar to this idea of like aiming for neutral. Yeah. Like trying to find a balance that works, that's healthy for you. Yeah. So, okay. Can too much self-esteem lead to things like narcissism and inflated ego? Mm -hmm. I think... I don't know. It, this is a tough one because probably in some people, yes, maybe. Well, I would say that I think baby boomers definitely make the argument that millennials that, are all yes. narcissistic <laughs> all and entitled of because of the self-esteem movement and all their dang participation trophies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, well, we did an entire episode on this. Episode 148 was all about narcissism and narcissistic, narcissistic personality disorder. Um, but often narcissistic tendencies can just be fueled by things like uncertainty about one's own self-worth. And that can lead to things like a puffed up self-protective shield of superiority. So it's like just bluffing. Like posturing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In order to hide things like your own insecurity or your own uh, low self-esteem. So it can often really fluctuate, I think, and in response to things like social praise or rejection. Mm. So obviously someone can at least appear to the world to be really narcissistic or really full of oneself or inf have an inflated ego, but probably on the inside, a lot of other things are churning and it's actually just sort of a protective shield for them. Yeah. Probably not an actual like genuine sense of high oh. self-esteem or high self-worth. Yeah, exactly. Like a, yeah. yeah. I think that's like the common misconception is like, yeah. if someone thinks too highly of their self, they're a narcissist and it's like, no, it's actually usually a defense right. against actually not thinking very highly of yourself. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And it is that balance still. It, it makes me think of, uh, our acting teacher, Jace, it, uh -huh. in his class when he used to talk about like the, it was like a quiet sense of arrogance a, or what a was it? A peculiar kind of arrogance. Kind of arrogance. Yeah. Called it. Yeah, exactly. And it wasn't, again, he's like, it's not an overinflated arrogance by any means. Like when you walk into a room for an audition, for example, but it's just having a, a sense of knowing who you are and that mm. everything you know, I, I don't need you to tell me that I'm okay. Like, I know that I'm good without you kind of thing. Like having poise rather than like posturing? Or? Yeah, I mm. think so to a degree. Interesting. Which is, it, it yeah. is that yeah. really like fine line, that like yeah. razor's edge there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think it's, it's interesting too that it is a very inside out kind of thing. Like mm -hmm. it's from the inside and it's not so simple to just look at someone else and know whether they have high or low self-esteem. Yeah. In the same way that I don't think it's fair to assume that other people can tell you if your self-esteem is high or low. Yeah, sure. That's true. Right? Yeah. That it that it could be maybe you actually are working on getting a higher self-esteem and that's a really good and healthy thing and someone else with a very low self-esteem might see that and because of that it was it invidiousness <laughs> you know that, <laughs> that like envy and jealousy and wanting to tear someone down mm -hmm. that like vindictiveness out of envy will tell you like oh you're being a narcissist or you're being arrogant or something sure. like that yeah that could very easily like tear you down if you're thinking that other people get to tell you what your self-esteem is yeah yeah how sense? much you're worth or not yeah, or how or how much you think you're worth. Sure. Right? Kind of like yeah. we talk about with like, no one else can tell you whether you're happy or not, mm -hmm. right? They might be able to say, I've noticed these specific things, but someone else can't look at you and go, you say you're happy doing this type of relationship, but, but I know you're, you're not. not. Yeah. Right? That's, <laughs> yeah. I've been there with people telling yeah. me that. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Definitely. Yeah. All right. So, dun -dun -dun, how do we do it? How do we build higher self-esteem? <laughs> can, we, can we build it? Yes, we uh, can. And it will come. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, All right, so we have come up here with our seven habits of highly effective self-esteemers. No, self-esteem people. I just, I don't know. yeah, I put that because 
it D- Dedeker had a part of that. It was like seven habits of highly effective poly people. Poly people, yeah, I think, yeah. yeah. Right, we and did we that, did that episode. Yeah. yeah. So right. now it's self-esteem people. <laughs> Great. Self-esteem people. Love it. <laughs> All right. So the first one here um, is to stand or sit in a posture of confidence. Okay, let me switch my posture here. <laughs> um, there's actually a really cool TED Talk about this that I recommend checking out. Uh, what's what's her name? Do you remember? Uh, it's uh, uh, Lisa Cuddy, I think. Yeah, something that like right. that. That sounds right. Um, but yeah, she does this really cool TED Talk about the research on this. But okay, here's the basics of how it goes. The posture of confidence can look a few Superman. different ways, but the easiest is like the Wonder Woman or Superman pose. Like you're standing, your legs are a little bit apart, your chest is out, shoulders are back, your hands are on your hips, you're very open. Another one is like the um, Olympic medalist pose. So this one's your arms like in a V up above your head. The victory pose. The victory pose. Uh, this one's really cool because they found that even, uh, even people who were born blind will do this pose when they win something, like oh, if they win a race, without ever having seen another person wow. do it. There is something natural to like the victory of putting your arms over your head. The dog opening loves your this body victory up. pose. Yeah. She's so just, excited. She's like <laughs> even even the dog is responding to the victory yeah. pose. Yeah. The dog loves it. Um, sitting versions of this um, you know, involve kind of like, again, think about more opening up your like chest area. So it's like sitting maybe with your hands behind your head with your elbows out to the side, you know, that like CEO. Yeah. Like <laughs> leaning back, <laughs> leaning back. Your feet up. Exactly. Exactly. That sort of a look. And if you think about this, this is directly in contrast to the way most of us are all the time, which is mm. closed and hunched oh, over a true. phone yeah. or a computer. Right. Yeah. Right. And that they, what they found is that doing this, taking one of these poses just for like a minute, literally like 60 seconds, mm right away affects your levels of cortisol and of wow. uh, testosterone that it will, cause those work against each other. Like having slightly higher testosterone will help lower your cortisol, yeah. which is that really unhealthy stress hormone when you have too much of it too often. Um, and that having that small shrunken posture will increase your cortisol actually. It is. Yeah. So I actually did this in the middle of a fight with a partner once wow. where I think it was his recommendation because he knew like about the whole victory pose thing, you know? And so, yeah, so we stopped and, you know, did the victory pose, I think just for a minute. Like and it, like, timed it, it out. Yeah. yeah it kind of helped because like in the middle of like very high tension, because it feels a little silly if you're both just standing there yeah. doing victory pose. So it helped to break the tension a little bit. Yeah. Um, Next time you two get in a thing, I'm going to be like, no. Like, Victory pose. pose. <laughs> huh. That's great. We yeah. should try that. Yeah. Yeah. So like, Victory pose, no talking, like no fighting while you're in Victory pose. Mm-hmm. Um, and it actually really did help. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Something to consider. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think it's also worth thinking about your posture just in general too. Yeah. That if, yeah. if through your work day and there's now there's like devices out there for like helping to remind you of your posture, stuff like that. It's worth looking into because I think it does actually make yeah. a pretty big difference. You in can even, if you can't afford like a, a, divor- a, a, divor- a divorce, a divorce, Jeez. get a divorce. If you can't afford a device or something, you can even just like get some pillows and jury rig, like ah. putting it behind your back so that you're not like slumped into your office chair, but that it's yeah. forcing you to be upright. Like that's at least that's the trick for like, if you're doing sitting meditation or something. Yeah, um, that's so smart. yeah, there's ways that you can kind of trick or even setting a it. reminder through the yeah, day. If you work too. with coworkers, make it a buddy system where it's like, I'm going to, if I notice you slouching, I'll, you know, mention it and you do the same for me. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Uh, all right. Number two is to build your capacity for energy. What does that mean? Well, so this is something that Emily and I, uh, again, that acting teacher that she was talking about. Yes. Something that he would say is instead of saying I'm nervous, say I'm excited. Because it's like the same response in your body. It's like mm-hmm. the, the butterflies in the pit of the stomach feeling that that happens whether or not you're nervous or you're excited. So it's really just about the way in which you frame it in your own mind. Mm-hmm. And I do this all the time yeah. when I'm when I'm like about to perform. Yeah. So yeah, and it's great. I mean, if I, you know, if I'm about to go up for an opening night or something, then I'll just be like, okay, I can feel these things happening, but it's just a, 
it's just me being excited it's right. fine yeah that's funny because i used to when i was auditioning more frequently i used to try to be like if i was nervous about an audition i would try to reframe it as no 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 this is an audition this is opening night and mm. that kind of feeling like yeah. excite, like a little bit of nervous but mostly excitement yeah you know and kind of try to think of it that way rather than just purely nervousness yeah that's cool that's interesting yeah and, and for those of you listening out there being like Ugh, you guys talk about like acting all the time how's that relevant to my normal life uh, and it's funny if you, you might not quite get it if you haven't done it, but at being an actor and like going on auditions and things like that is, I think, one of the probably worst things you can do to your self-esteem or most yeah. challenging things you can do to it. You have to find a ways to, to cope, cope with it yeah. because you're essentially you're just every day just being no like, am I time. good enough? And you're getting told no most of the time. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's, it is a really boot camp. I, I think we've all definitely learned a lot from that. Even if Emily's the only one still pursuing that. Yeah. She's the one, only one with enough resilience to keep <laughs> doing it. Yeah, that never bothered me as much as other things. Like people, you know, maybe not commenting on my smarts as much, like definitely bothered me way oh, more than being mm. told well, no. Well, that's a whole Los Angeles entertainment industry of course. kind of thing. Yeah, that's right. a whole other episode, which is not this episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Okay. So what else? <laughs> Number three. Uh, and this one's uh, sort of a double one, actually. And this is um, your physical health. So that means to exercise regularly and also to sleep enough. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to talk about sleeping enough real quickly, because I think the exercising regularly, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, I know I should do that. Like, duh, endorphins. Really, yeah. you should. Yeah. Right? Do it. It Like, it does help your body And can chemistry. I clarify, it's not like <laughs> definitely the thought pattern that I've fallen into sometimes where I'm like, I have low self-confidence or like self-esteem about my body. Okay, let mm. me just exercise so I can get a six pack and then I'll have high confidence <laughs> again. But you're talking about more like, no, nah, just like get up and move yeah, like, like to get yourself healthy, like that. not focused on like trying to fix your body or something like that. Do something to make yourself sweat from exertion, at, you know, as often as you can. Some yeah. Like Emily and I have a doctor who tells us every single day for uh, 20 minutes. My doctor too. Oh yeah, actually. we all have the yeah, same doctor. We all have all the same doctor. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, of 20 minutes every single day yeah. of some kind of exercise that makes you sweat. It could yeah. be doing some quick yoga. It could be going for a jog. You know, it could look lots of different ways. Um, not just sitting in a sauna and sweating, but, you know, exercising and getting yourself getting to sweat. Getting your heart rate heart up. Pumping. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, or, but, you know, there's a, lots of other options as well. But those actually do, like, help balance out your hormones and things like that. They help you use some of that cortisol. But, again, like, that stress hormone is really damaging to us when we have it in our bodies all the time and we're not getting rid of it. Yeah. Um, but that cortisol is what you use for, like, running away from a dinosaur, or something, right? Like running away from... I don't from think humans probably and dinosaurs, not a dinosaur, dinosaurs but ever we, existed like, together, but We're not sure. going to be too legalistic about this. <laughs> Trying to be accessible to the creationists out there oh, listening. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I can't believe you just said that. Um, so, but, right, like running away from a monster, right? Running away from something In a scary. parallel universe. Yeah. Just running away from something that's trying to get you. Just, just trying to get you. Get you. <laughs> Right. But, uh, you know, exercising, you're actually like flushing some of those things out. You're using that physical energy that otherwise just stays inside and turns into, you know, ulcers and things like that. Um, but I want to talk about sleeping enough. Yeah. This one is huge and it's huge for me personally. And I also know it's huge for a lot of people and pretty much everyone when they hear about this, they plug their ears and they go, la, 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 la. I can't hear you. I'm more productive when I'm not sleeping as much like Productive, successful people don't sleep that much. I have to not sleep that much. I have too much to do. I can't sleep. Like, whatever it is. Yeah. It's Wrong. just not true. It's just not Wrong. true. There's so much research showing that getting enough sleep, which means, by the way, like eight and a half hours. <sighs> That's yeah, it's so not even. Amazing. It's not even the seven that people will be like, oh, yeah, seven's plenty or seven. It's eight and a half is what you should be getting. And I find that for me, my self esteem. This, this, I think, almost more than anything else will affect my self-esteem mm -hmm. and, like, my resilience to criticism, like, my ability to stay motivated, to stay focused, to, to not... I cry way more when I'm tired. Oh, absolutely. Oh, my God. No question. Yeah. 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 Um, it's getting enough sleep. And it's hard yeah. to do, and I'm not always great about it, but just knowing that has been really helpful for me. Cause it almost kind of takes some of the pressure off when I'm like, gosh, why am I feeling this way? What's wrong with me? I'm kind of like, right. 
I haven't been sleeping enough. Yeah. And even if that's hard to catch back up on, I at least know that's my goal. Yeah. That's what I need to figure out how to do. That's good. Anyway, there's my soapbox about sleeping. Great. I like. <laughs> so, okay, this next one is to visualize and imagine the confidence that you're going to be propelling into the world. And I really like this one because it's something that athletes do. My favorite boy, Yazu Ruhanyu, <laughs> he was injured last year, right before the Olympics. Like, it basically, for two, almost three months, he couldn't be on the ice. But he visualized himself doing all of his jumps perfectly, like having this like gorgeous, perfect program. And so when he finally could get back on the ice, like three weeks to go before the Olympics, he was that much further along mm. in being able to actually do it. And, and he, he won, won the Olympics again. Yeah. <laughs> that was his second time. This is why like I love his, him. His 200th world record or something like yeah, that. No, yeah. yeah. So anyways, he won and he did it. And so with this, it's, it's essentially like, Firmly be connected with the sensation of relaxation, like stand there, close your eyes, just be relaxed. And then in your mind's eye, see yourself doing something that, that you want more confidence in, for example. So that can be like speaking in a front of a room full of people or mm -hmm. being on a podcast and being better <laughs> or whatever. Meeting, yeah. Whatever meeting your metamor. Be. There you go. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So stuff like that. Um, this is kind of one of those fake it till you make it things sometimes, mm -hmm. but it is a good way of just training your mind and your body that like, Hey, I am good at this thing. Like all of this stuff that I have anxiety over, I actually am instead really great at it and I have confidence about it. So it is a good, like fake it till you make it thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, the next one is give yourself permission to be in the process, to take risks and make mistakes. So obviously throughout all of this, nobody's going to be perfect at their levels of self-confidence at like their goals and actually making their goals happen in life. When I look at this, when I think about us in multi-amory, because it has been like a long road of Jeez. four years. And we really initially at, at least were not necessarily like super confident about what we were doing. <laughs> we were just like, I don't know, we're going to try this and go for it. Um, but then I think, slowly building that confidence over the the past four years has like kept it going and kept it being this thing that we like actually really believe in still got a long way to go sure i mean <laughs> yes i hear you and and jace sometimes also is like wow everyone hates us like kind of thing but but honestly uh i think it, it, it is a testament to the fact that we have kept a certain sense of confidence about what we're doing um, just that it, it has this like longevity to it. I think that thing about like being allowed to make mistakes yeah. is, is really valuable. And that's one I know I personally struggle with a lot. Sure. Feeling like if I ever make a mistake. I'm right, a bad person. That, yeah. That it's like I, 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 shouldn't, I shouldn't be here talking to anyone or, or you know, be mm. in the world at all. Like yeah. I should just be written off and kicked out of society no. or something like that. Right. Um, that that's. I think that one's that one's big for me at least is yeah. that being allowed to make mistakes and that doesn't mean you're a failure. It just means you're learning from those and that's part of the process. Yeah. 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 So the next one is to speak kindly to yourself. So that means not just seeking praise or any kind of verbal validation only from other people. It is okay to seek that. I think it is okay to ask for that. Mm -hmm. Um, but make sure that you're setting yourself up so that you're not relying on that to be the only basis for your self-esteem. Um, it's important to also praise yourself as well. Yeah. Um, and this is, I mean, this is such a nuts of thing for me that like I didn't even realize how unkindly I spoke to myself until I started meditating, mm. actually. And I honestly, I think this is why a lot of people avoid a meditation practice for many other reasons, but that it's really scary to see what's on the inside and <laughs> yeah. to hear what's on the inside sometimes yeah. and to just really get a straight up sense of like, whoa, I am so mean to myself sometimes, or I have such mm. really like really dark beliefs about myself. Um, and so it's really important to just like make space to be aware of that. I, I uh, of course I'm always going to be an advocate for meditation is going to like really open up a lot of things for you as far as awareness of what your thoughts are doing. Um, it doesn't have to be meditation necessarily. Um, there's a great metaphor in a book that I read about like 
if you had a roommate who said the things to you yeah. that mm. you say to you, like, what would you do with that roommate? Like, yeah. would kick you them be, out. Would you be happy? Would you kick them out? Would you get up in their face? You know, would you feel sad? Like, you know, just to kind of put it in perspective that your relationship with yourself is as important to cultivate as your relationship with anyone else who's around you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, I think it's especially important to just find a way to become aware of um, something that Jace taught me about recently, which are ants, <laughs> automatic negative thought. Yeah, and this isn't this isn't my own. I I forget the I name. Wasn't sure of, if the S was part uh, of it or not. I forget the name of the. There's a psychologist who coined this term. Yeah, um, but but, yeah, but I think that's the important part is that it's like knee jerk negative thoughts that come up in response to something happening. And once you can kind of start to get a beat on those and kind of start to change and at least become aware and start to reframe those, it's really going to change a lot about I think how you feel about yourself and your self esteem as well. Yeah. Yeah. And the last thing, something that's really important is to be okay to ask for help and also to offer your help to others. I'm so terrible at asking for help. I really am um, because I was raised in Western culture yeah. um, and also particularly in my family of origin, like self-reliance and independence was like the gold standard, totally. you know, being able to do things on your own and not ask for help was really highly praised. Be and a strong, independent woman. Exactly. And so there's a part of that in me that I do feel proud of, that I feel glad that I'm so self-reliant and independent. But then at the other hand, it means like I have a really hard time being vulnerable and asking for help. Um, so that means not being afraid of collaboration because collaboration means that sometimes you can reach results that wouldn't be possible when you're by yourself. Um, in a recent review of contemporary literature, Stephen Post, who is the head of the Case Western Reserve University Medical School, the school with the longest name ever, oh my God, okay. Uh, so Stephen Post found that there was a connection between giving altruism and happiness. And so that's the thing is that when we play a positive role in our families, in our friendships, our communities, our relationships, we do feel good about ourselves. Um, and we feel that we are fulfilling a greater purpose or a more meaningful purpose in our lives. And so definitely like asking for help, being reminded of your support network of the people around you who love you, and also being willing and energetic to offer your help to others can really help to create a really good, like positive feedback loop that can help with your self-esteem and self-worth. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I feel like this is even something that uh, Dedeker, you've talked about on this show in the past about like when you're feeling down. Yeah, the pay it forward thing. To like yeah. take a moment and think like who in my life could I just randomly say something nice to or do something nice for? Yeah. I think it's it's definitely connected to that. Yeah, it takes sure. like all of the maybe self-hate off of yourself and instead like puts like some love onto someone else. Yes, it's yeah. really kind transformative. Of, yeah, it gets you out of your own way, I guess. Right. Yeah, so awesome. This has been really good and something I definitely struggle with a lot and it's really good to get some great tools. Um, and we do have a call to action for our listeners. So have any of you dealt with self-esteem issues in the past and what great tools do you have uh, to help you gain more self-esteem over the years or during the times when you've had difficulty with it. Mm -hmm. We'd also love to hear what your experience is using these tools. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. If you've used any of them and then if you like listen to this episode and start employing them, then what, what did you find? What happened? How did they work? So the best place to share your thoughts with other listeners is on this episode's discussion thread and our private Facebook or discourse forums. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can email us at info at multiamory.com. Leave us a voicemail at 678-M-U-L-T-I-0-5. Or you can leave us a voice message on Facebook. Multiamory is created and produced by Dedeker Winston, Jace Lindgren, and me, Emily Matlack. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. I'm Dirty Lola, host of Sex at a Go Go and ringleader of the Pussy Posse. And you're listening to a Swing Set podcast at swingset.fm.